Hi, my name is Miltus, and I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, UK. In today's lecture, I'd like to discuss about graph neural networks and how they are used in software engineering research and practice. First, I would like to do a quick recap of some background knowledge that you probably heard in previous lectures, but it's worth revisiting before going forward. First of all, what is machine learning? Machine learning is a set of mathematical models that are defined by a set of parameters. We humans design those models and these parameters, which you can think as knobs, you can turn them slightly left or slightly right. As you turn them left or right, they affect how the model behaves. The goal is to learn those parameters from data in such a way that this model represents and models something in the domain of interest. Of course, as people say, as this quote says of George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. The goal here is to create models that, first of all, are tractable, so we can actually learn them, but are capable also of representing the phenomenon we are trying to model. Today, I will be primarily discussing supervised machine learning, maybe the most common form of machine learning. The main idea here is that you have a dataset of samples. Each sample is made of an X, the input, and a prediction, Y. The goal of each model is to get X as input and try to predict Y as faithfully as possible. In order to measure how well or badly a model performs, we use a loss function. The loss function takes the output of the model, the F of X, and compares it to the ground truth Y, to the real prediction. So this loss tells us how good or bad a model is at predicting some specific quantity. So the goal of supervised machine learning is to take this loss function and learn the parameters, this theta that is shown in the slide, such that the loss function is as low as possible. So how do we find the parameters that minimize the loss function? There are many different methods, but one of the most common ones, especially in deep learning, is gradient descent. The idea here is that we compute an estimate of the derivative of the loss function. Then, using the derivative, we take a step towards updating the parameters theta towards the direction that minimizes the loss function L. The holy grail of machine learning is generalization. This means that we are looking for a model that generalizes beyond the data that we have actually observed. So, on the left-hand side, you observe a form of underfitting, where a very simple model, like this red line, tries to fit the more complex form of blue dots. On the right-hand side, you see an overfitting model, a model where it can model exactly the observed points, but it doesn't generalize well. The ideal place is somewhere in between those two models. Towards discussing neural networks, we need to first discuss the idea of distributed vector representations, also called embeddings. The question that comes to mind is how do we represent a discrete set of elements within a vector? One way of doing this is through a local representation, or one hot. The idea here is that you have a binary vector where everything is zero except from a single element in each case. The component that is turned on, the foreign component that is at one, is the, the representation of the relevant object. However, this means that these vectors have to be of size v, and this size v is commonly quite large. In contrast, we can do something better, and these are the distributed representations or embeddings. The idea here is that the meaning of each element is distributed across the components. So maybe, for example, if you look here at banana and mango, the first two components seem to be very similar, and this could be something about the similarity of those two elements, for example, their yellowness or their fruitiness. Instead, a dog is not very yellow, so it doesn't have those components very, um, uh, components very similar. 
So going from a local representation to a distributed representation can happen through an embedding matrix E, which is a learned, uh, a learned parameter of a model. The idea is that you multiply, do matrix multiplication between a local representation and the embedded matrix E, then you can get the distributed representations. At the same time, because D, this dimension here, is much smaller than V, you get significant memory savings compared to using localized representations. So finally, let's talk about graphs. A graph has a set of nodes or vertices. These are the blue nodes here on the right, the A, B, and C. These tend to represent entities. Now, a graph also has edges or links, and each edge could have different type. So here you see black edges, blue edges, and red edges. You can think of these edges as indicating a relationship between two nodes. So for example, here you can see that node D and node F are related through a blue edge. We can now move on and discuss graph neural networks and the core idea behind graph neural networks, neural message passing. So what is a graph neural network? An essential component of our graph neural networks are the graph representation of a problem. This is something that we humans design. We essentially encode in a graph a set of nodes, a set of entities, and their relationships among them. These are the edges that they have among them. And now within each node, we endow each node, we give to each node an initial representation, an initial embedding, an initial distributed vector representation. This embedding has information about the node itself. The information that you don't look through the graph or the context that each node belongs in, but exactly about the information that a node has. Now, what kind of information each node stores they will differ depending on the domain and the exact problem that you are trying to solve. So, graph neural network accepts a graph and each node has some initial representations. The output of a graph neural network is exactly the same graph, but now the node representations do not have information just about the node, but also how the node belongs within this graph. Essentially, once a graph neural network has processed a graph, the graph itself doesn't matter. Any relational information is encoded in the output vector representations that we have. We can then take those representations and use them for a task-specific purpose and apply the loss that we are looking for. It is important to note here that graph neural networks don't rely on the exact way that a graph looks like, so in the graph topology. All the graphs you see on the left can be processed by exactly the same graph neural network. The idea behind this, which we will explore next, is that graph neural networks define a local function based on a node and its direct neighbors in order to create a good neural network that can generalize across different topologies of graphs. So the whole idea of neural message passing on graph neural networks is that they define a local function. So let's focus on this small, very small graph that you see here where node F is connected to E and D through two edges of different color. Now, each node, as we discussed earlier, has a, sta a state, has a vector representation associated with it. So here D, E and F all have a different vector. At the first step, we look at exactly the distance one neighbors. We use D and E, the representation of D and E, along with the edge information, in order to prepare a message. A message is like a conceptual thing. In practice, this is just a vector, which is a function of the node, one node, from which an edge originates, the target node, which the node edge targets, and the type of edge here. So here, for example, the message, this message depends on D, on the red edge, and F, whereas this message here depends on E, the black edge, and F. So once we have prepared the message, then we can move forward, and using all the messages, we can push them directly to F. 
and F needs to summarize the information, to summarize the messages it receives. Note here that the order of these messages should not matter. So whatever happens in this stage of summarizing should not depend on the order of messages. It should be permutation invariant. And we'll discuss later how this is achieved. The final state is that you take the information that was received along with the current state of node F and you use some network, which can be many different things, in order to compute the next node representations. So note here now that this new representation here, F, first of all, depends only on the distance one neighbors, so D and E. And now, instead of having the information that originally F had here, now it has information about F, but also the information that was stored in D and E. So let's look at this a bit more closely. You can think of this neural message passing as the following very simple pseudocode. For each time step t, we're going to do the following. For each node in the graph, we're going to first aggregate the information from all its direct neighbors, this set n. Once we aggregate them, we're going to use this information a and update the state of f into a new state. So now the state of the new state of f has information, not just about itself, but, but from all the information it has received from the messages it has got from its direct neighbors. In a slightly more mathematical notation, what we can do is we have some function f that we compute a vector that combines information about node, here, for example, d and f, and the fact that they are going through an edge, a red edge here. All these messages are aggregated with a permutation invariant Function. So here I have this union operator just to, uh, to push this point further. All these messages should be aggregated in a way that the order that they are aggregated with is not important because the edges that are incoming into a node do not have a specific order. Finally, we have the red function q, uh, which is specific and is at the point t and gets the node the representation of f the summarized information from all the neighbors and updates the, the, the representation of f. So what this means now is here that f, whereas previously it had no information, in the next step has information not just about the, the one that they had before, but also those that it received uh, from its direct neighbors. So you can think now of taking that network and copy pasting at each node. Each node has exactly the same network, but has able, is able to receive information from each node and update its own state. So let's see how this works. First of all, each node has a representation uh, that is associated with. This is the information that the node, each node has at each time step. Then, at the first point, a clock ticks. Once the clock ticks, then each node creates the messages and computes the messages for its neighbors. So for example, here, this node E prepares a message that depends compute on computing function F based on the fact of the representation that E has, the representation G has, and the fact that these are connected through a black edge. Then once this has been computed, you can send the messages directly to your neighbors. So the next step here is to aggregate those messages in a permutation invariant way. So the order of these messages that are aggregated shouldn't matter. And then once you have done that, you can update the current node state. So in this case, each node will take all the messages they received, it is summarized the view of them and will update its own state. Then the clock will tick again. Note here that as we go went through this process, both these black and blue uh, boxes do not crucially depend on how the graph looks like. This is a very local function and can work on any graph as long as it has the same set of types of edges, like colors of edges, and some representations. So the idea here is now that you have this, you can think of this as a, as a process going through time where all nodes exchange messages with all nodes. So for example, E and D will send messages to F in the first time step, on the second time step, and so on. But at each point, these nodes will have 
information from their own neighbors. So what you can conceptually think about this is the following. In the beginning, each node not only has information about itself. The representation has information about only that node. After one time step, one message passing step, then each node knows information about itself and its distance one neighbors. At the next step, it will know information about distance two neighbors, distance one neighbors, and itself. So by repeating this process again and again, we can essentially propagate information n steps away. So far, we've described the forward process. We haven't described anything about training, but nothing will change there. The question is, okay, we have a graphical network, we have computed its output representations, now what? Well, this is a task-specific problem. We can use this output of representations, this output vectors, and do some tasks. Some of them could be selecting a node, finding which node is the one that we care about or classifying each node, adding some form of a label, if you wish, to each node about something it represents, or perform graph classification, aggregate every, all the information about the graph and try to predict something about the whole graph. So let's discuss how this would look like in a node classification case where we want for each node to make a binary classification. Imagine that for each node, we want to say 0 or 1, true or false. How do we do that? Well, we take the output representation H from the graph neural network. Then we pass it through a linear layer, each one of them. right? So you see here on the right how this could look like mathematically, where sigma is the sigmoid function, which is a standard, uh, standard layer, a standard perceptron. So now x is a prediction of whether, whether our prediction here should be close to 0 or close to 1. And once we have ground truth data, which we need to for our training purposes, we can compute a binary cross-entropy loss. So this loss tells us how good or bad our predictions are. Now, the only thing we need to do is to get this loss, and during training, we want to differentiate that. So we have the full fun uh, function that represents graphical networks, the initial uh, representation of the nodes, the la linear layer W, and the bias B. And uh, from that, we want to differentiate it in terms of the loss and try to take a step towards minimizing this loss. And in that sense, we can train both a graph neural network and also train all the other components that might be connected in and out of that network. There are many different flavors of graph neural networks. In this slide, we will discuss gated graph neural networks. Here, what you see is that in order to prepare a message, the decision, the design decision of creating this neural network is that you take the representation h of a neighboring node, so this h here is this vector here, and multiply it with a matrix ek, which depends crucially on the type of the edge. So here, this could be that, if, that k is 0 for red edges and k is 1 for white edges. Once we have that, we have essentially computed these terms are the messages. We can then aggregate, summarize this information by using the simple summation operator. So the, this sums all the messages from all the nodes n, j that are directly linked to node n. So the summation operator is permutation invariant. It doesn't matter in which order we sum up those messages. Once we have M, the summary of the received information, we can pass it directly to this blue, to this red part here, where it takes the previous state of F, the input messages M, and computes a new node state. As you see here, again, this is a local function of a node and its direct neighbors. Another commonly used network is a graph convolutional networks, GCN. Here, things are somewhat simpler. First of all, we take the summation of all nodes here as form directly as messages. So the in directly information, the age of D and the age of E are here. Our summarization is essentially a summation across all those vectors. And we also add this directly with the information from F. 
Then we multiply with a linear layer Wt and take the element-wise average. Finally, the, the state here, the new state of f, is computed by just computing the sigmoid of this term here. So having in mind these two graph neural network architectures, uh, we are as, as close in, uh, about to implement those things. But we first need a set of tricks. One thing that is worth mentioning is the idea of backwards edges. In a directed graph, like the one you see here on the left, you see that some nodes, uh, some nodes like node D, will never receive information because they have no incoming edges. One common trick to use here is to add explicitly backwards edges, so the dashed edges that you see here. So in that, once you have these extra new types of edges, what you achieve is essentially an information flow back to nodes like node D, who would, which would have never have received any information. The discussion so far was more on the conceptual level and the mathematical level of graph neural networks. Now, there is obviously a question. How do you take these equations and put them down into matrix operations and then into code? So let's try and look how this would look like. Let's first discuss the idea of an adjacency matrix. An adjacency matrix, like the one you see here, is a square matrix of it's also binary. Each entry suggests whether an edge exists between one node and another. So in this case here, you may imagine that this node here, this, this first row, uh, belongs to node 0, the next one to node 1, and the next one to node 2. And the same thing with the columns. Now, if we are to place, uh, to place an 1 exactly when an edge exists, we can see that, for example, the edge from 0 to 1 uh, here that you can see appears. So we introduce an edge from 0 to 1 here. The same thing for 0 to 2 and 1 to 2. So in that sense, we can represent in a matrix form our edges, our graphs. Now, of course, we have an extra set of things that we can do. Let's take this idea that we have some symbolic variable A, B and C for each of those three nodes here. If we were to do a matrix multiplication between our agency matrix N and the, let's call it, information N, what you will see is that you will get, by multiplying A to N, you will get this vector here. It's as if A has received no information, as node B or node 1 has received information from A, and node 2 has received information both from A and B. So this idea of matrix multiplication looks like our message passing, and this is essentially the idea we're going to use in order to transfer the conceptual concept of message passing into matrix notation. In practice, we can also have multiple matrices and multiple adjacency matrices in a graph, one per edge type. So here, maybe the blue edges uh, that you can see here uh, can be thought as uh, having the index 0. So the adjacency matrix for the blue edges is A0. Instead, the adjacency matrix for the black edges, and there is only one in this sample graph here, is A1. So we can have multiple of those uh, adjacency matrices, and we'll see how we'll use them to represent graph neural networks in the next slide. Let's now map the neural message passing into matrix operations. At the first stage, we have the representation of all nodes, this HD that you can see here. Now, this is a matrix that has dimensions, number of nodes, times D, where D is this vector representation, the size of the vector representation of each node. In the gated graph neural networks, what we need to do, as we saw here, is essentially do a matrix multiplication with EK, EK is the edge-specific message computation, and the HT, the one we have here. So now MT here has exactly the information, the messages that need to be sent to each node. We can then use this trick with the adjacency matrix AK for edge type K and the messages to be sent MT or the time T of type K and essentially propagate them to their direct neighbors. 
and we do this for all types of edges. So RT is essentially this summarized information that has been received for each node. Finally, to compute this, uh, this update, we take the previous state of each HT and the received messages to get the next ones. So GRU, of course, is uh, more complicated, but if we had a single recurrent neural network, this would just look as the two matrix multiplications that you see here, along with a sigmoid. So overall, now we have mapped the graph neural network operations, uh, the conceptual ones, into matrix operations. The next step is now to express these matrix operations as code. We need to first discuss Einstein's summation, which is a very useful way of representing the multiplications over our matrices. So let's take this very simple example, and this is example uses NumPy, but Einsum appears in PyTorch and TensorFlow 2. Now let's say that this matrix A it has dimensions, which might be concrete, but let's call them T times D. So you see here that T times D appears here. The same thing for B here, where we can say that the dimensions are Q times D. So you can imagine that T, D, and Q have concrete dimensions, but we still use them as ways of representing things here. And what we're saying is that the output C should have, uh, have sizes T times Q. So this T and this Q that should come up here, and specifically in this order. Essentially, what we're looking for is to represent this summation here. And this is what Einstein's summation let us do. We can, of course, do many more interesting and many more useful things, such as the example here, where A for is, has the dimensions A, B, C, or B has the dimensions B, E, and so on. So Einstein summation is just a very useful tool to, to have in our toolkit. So let's look at graph neural networks as a pseudocode. Again, what we have here is uh, the same uh, pseudocode that looked like before, but in slightly more detail. We have a loop here that works for every time step t. So, of course, I'm not going to go into that, but this represents how different operations happen, different ticks of that clock we have been discussing. The first part is computing the messages. So here we are computing the messages that come from the node state through the edge transformations of each edge type k. Then again, we can move the received messages and we can essentially aggregate everything by using these operators, where here we have the adjacency matrix. And now once we have the received messages, that we can simply use the GRU. So the matrix operations were transferred directly as a pseudocode. Mapping the original, uh, the original things, what you see here is that this H, here are the node states that we have before, and we keep updating at each time step. These messages to be sent are these messages here, each indexed by K, by the type of the edge. And finally, we have the received uh, messages, which is this, uh, the, these, uh, these uh, tensors here. And of course, finally, we have the GRU. Or, again, if you want to look at this closer to that pictorial representation, the first part is what represents the preparation of messages, the second part is the summarization, and the third part is updating the node states. Of course, there are parameters here, and we have been discussing those parameters for some time, but there is a good question, what are those parameters? These are the parameters that are trained. These are the parameters that represent the graph neural network. I'll pause here for a moment and let you find those parameters. So the parameters here are in just these two places. The edge transforms. So for each edge transform, we have a matrix that uh, we're going to we need to learn, and the GRU, the recurrent unit, also has parameters. These are all the parameters of the gated graph neural network, and using those we can compute things uh, that are re related about the graph. 
There is one last thing we haven't discussed yet. And this idea now is that the adjacent matrix is a dense matrix, which is an n by n matrix. For average size graphs, like a thousand nodes, right? This will be a thousand by thousand matrix. And this is very memory intensive. So this is a problem, and there are techniques to solve this, but we don't have time to very to discuss these things. But I encourage you to look at the literature about these things. It shouldn't be surprising that graphs are a very general structure and many other models can be thought in some way or another as graph neural networks. The first example are convolutional neural networks that have been used in computer vision. Here you can think of connecting the grid of pixels as, uh, as you usually have uh, here with edges. So if you connect all the local pixels to a specific uh, other pixel with different types of edges, so top left, top right, and, and so on, you essentially can retrieve a, con a, a convolutional neural network. And this is especially the case with graph convolutional neural networks, where in this case, special case of grid would degenerate exactly to a standard convolutional neural network. Another special case are deep sets, or the question of how do we represent a set of objects, a set of vectors in the case of neural networks. This can essentially be cast as a network, as a graph, that is fully connected. So all nodes are connected with all nodes. This is essentially the same as self-attention, which is more or less what transformers are. If you remember from the last, uh, the last few lectures, what you will have seen is that transformers do not have any notion of ordering beyond the positional encodings that people add later. Great. So now we have finished discussing graph neural networks in a vacuum. Graph neural networks have been used in a wide range of applications, from chemistry to social networks, but they have also found a great uh, use in software engineering, which is, of course, the point of interest of this course and my research area. So, in the next part of the talk, I will be discussing how to use and how people have used graph neural networks in software engineering. Code is inherently a graph. We may not think of it as such when we write code, but in practice this is the case. Code is made of various entities from tokens, variables, syntax nodes, and all those entities have relationships among them. Here in this, uh, in this uh, slide here, you can see a relatively small snippet of code represented as a graph. This graph contains information from things like data flow, control flow, or syntax and other forms of semantics. These relationships, although maybe tools don't necessarily represent as a graph, are used widely. There are editors that need information about where to go when you press go to definition. There are static analysis tools that need to understand how data flows or how control flows. There are compilers who need to understand about the type of information about the type of a variable or how a variable is used in order to represent it and actually compile it down to machine code. Now, the way we represent code as a graph is not unique. It's a design decision that depends on the target problem and the kinds of relationships that we want to encode in this graph so that our models like graph neural networks can actually use. So let's now take a look at one possible way to represent programs as a graph. Of course, this is not the only way of doing this, and there are many different edges and nodes that one could think of to add. So let's take this simple example here, the assert.notNull of class. This is a simple statement, right? And it's made out of many, many tokens, which you see, you can see he, down here. Now, these nodes or entities represent tokens. What we can do is we can connect those uh, tokens, those entities, with a specific relationship, which says that this node and its next token is this one, or this one, or this one, and so on. This gets us information about the tokens. As you probably know very well, 
programs and code can be represented as a tree, as a syntax tree or as an abstract syntax tree. So we can further add this into our graph representation. So here, for example, I'm adding the abstract syntax tree of this very small snippet. You can see here that we have new nodes, new entities, that represents non-terminal symbols in the grammar of the program language. In this case, it's C sharp. We also introduced a different kind of edge, the edge that you see here, which represents that this node, for example, and this node, for example, are related by being AST child of one or another. So now in our graph, we have syntactic information, but we can add even more. Let's take another slightly simpler uh, example. Here we have a loop, uh, the while loop, and we have this computation x uh, that is being uh, things being added. This snippet of code is just here for illustrative purposes. It doesn't necessarily do something. However, what we can do here is we can start adding edges among the appearances of a specific variable. So, for example, we can introduce the last right edge, which says when was a variable last written. So, if we take, for example, this y here, the only and last time that it was written was, well, this instance of y here. However, if we take this x here, now there are two cases. The first case is that we just entered this while loop, so the last time that x was written was here, but we might be looping again and again. And so this x, the last time it was written, was this uh, node here. So essentially now we have introduced a new edge that indicates the relationships between two entities, essentially the appearances of x and y. Now, we can also add more edges. For example, when was a variable last used? And this is one case uh, where you can see this here. So the example here says that the if we're looping, y was probably last used in itself, or it was last used when it was seen here. Or if whenever whatever happens, as long as we just entered the loop, the last uh, we have made the check here in the while, and the last time that x was used uh, here was this appearance of x. So we can keep adding these edges. So for example, let me add the computed from edge, which says that this x is computed from this expression here. And of course, we can keep doing and repeating this process again and again. Other edges that have been used in practice, for example, include the returns to edge, which essentially indicates control flow information. Specifically, it says that this return statement here returns to that function. We can also add more edges. For example, we can indicate where does this uh, function foo bind to. So we can say, for example, that uh, this uh, formal argument sum is bound to the actual argument result. And this may be useful in some cases. So in the end of the day, the idea is that the entities in the program, which could be tokens, syntax nodes, variables, the comments, whatever you want to imagine, can be represented as nodes. And in turn, the relationships among those entities can be represented as special edges. So as different kinds of edges that represent different semantic relationships, such as, for example, when something was next used or whose AST child is this node. So all of this is a human design process. There is no unique way to represent programs as graphs, but we introduce all these features, all these elements, all these nodes, all these edges, in order to help our methods learn. And we do that, we introduce a new feature, for example, when we believe that this will be useful for some downstream task. In the academic literature, graph neural networks and graph representations of code have been explored in the recent past. So here I list four kind main areas that have been looked at. One of them is variable misuse. 
the idea of finding small packs where, for example, instead of using I, you use J. This is what are going to focus in the rest of, uh, of this section. We've also discussed about graph neural networks, about method naming or summarization, taking a graph representation of a function and turning it into a natural language comment or the name of that method that is descriptive enough. There are other people who have looked at code generation or repair, essentially how you take a graph representation of the code and try to fix uh, some part or how to generate a PS snippet of code. There are many other cases where people have tried to predict some property of the program. So, for example, in the ver very recently, there has been work about predicting type annotations in dynamic languages. So, in languages like JavaScript or TypeScript, where you don't have types, uh, but you can introduce new type annotations. Graph neural networks have been used there, for example, to predict whether a variable is an integer or a string or a list of strings and so on. There have been other cases where graph neural networks have been used to predict performance characteristic of programs. So in case especially of, of very specific programs interested in how fast a specific program is, then the hope here is to help with compiler optimizations. So now let's look at variable misuse tasks more closely. Here is a short code snippet from some C sharp code. The question here is to find where a specific variable might have been misused. So in this case, the result is already highlighted, and it is, of course, this class variable here. The developer who uh, actually wrote the code copy-pasted the line above and forgot to change class to first, which is this variable here, which the developer intended to actually use. Now, of course, this is a simple case of a variable misuse, and it's not hard to pinpoint this, but you probably understand with your experience of writing code that such small mistakes can slip. Especially you can understand that this example of variable misuse happened within a test, and realistically, no one tests a test. So the variable misuse task is about finding these kinds of misuses and pointing them out to the developer. The developer can then take a decision on whether this is an actually a variable misuse or something else. So let's try to tackle this task with graph neural networks. So first of all, we need some graph representation of code. The one I presented earlier would be sufficient for now. Before we use graph neural networks, we need, as we had discussed previously, the initial node representations, the information that each node has about itself without looking at the broader context. Let's take an example of how to do this. Here we have a node whose name is alt file prefix. So maybe this node represents a variable that is within our program. Now, in order to get its initial representation, one common way of doing this is to take the name and split it into sub tokens. For example, on camel case, like here, or in underscore, like Pascal case. Once we have split a name into sub tokens, then we can take each sub token, look it up in our embedding matrix, or get the distributed vector representation of that sub token, and then we have a set of those vectors. Finally, we can take those vectors, average them up, and get the initial vector representation for that node. So, essentially, this vector representation here we computed is the initial representation that a node has. So, here, this example might be the initial node representation of node C. And, of course, we can do this in parallel, in batch, for all other nodes in our graph. The next step is using the graph neural network. On the left here, we have various snippets of code where we are looking to detect variable misuses. Along with these graphs, of course, we have the initial node representations. We can then ask our graph neural network to process each one of those graphs and produce an output representation. We can then use this output representation for our variable misuse loss. 
Recall from earlier in this talk that essentially when we have the snippets on the left hand side, once we have processed them with a graph neural network, the edges don't really matter. We hope that the output representations of each node, such as the vector you see here or the vector that you see here, are essentially contextualized, have information not just about the node, but how they belong in the graph. So, for example, for a variable, we may hope that this representation has information not just maybe about the name of that, uh, of that uh, variable, which was the case in the beginning in the left-hand side, but also has information about how data flows around that node or how this variable is used, in what context, and so on. Now that we have the output representations of each node, the contextualized one, we can simply reorder them. So here, for example, you see the output representations for nodes A, B, and C, and so on. We're interested in predicting which node has a variable misuse. So in order to do that, we learn some vector n, which is a parameter of our model, and we compute the inner product of R each R, where R is each of the output representations of each node with N. This Rn gives us a scalar, gives us a unique number that says how likely it is that this node is uh, actually a variable misuse. We can then pass this through a softmax and we retrieve a probability distribution that you see here about each node. If we were to make a prediction, then we would say that with 40% probability, this node here, node E, is the one where there is a misuse. Of course, we can also say that the, we, the model believes that only 40%, this is the chance that this is actually a misuse node, so we don't have sufficient confidence. We, if we want, we can say only that uh, probability, if the probability is more than 90%, we raise a flag and notify the developer. Now imagine that we're in training and we actually have a ground truth label. Let's say that, for example, node F is the right one here. So we now need to backpropagate information and to learn from this information that F should have been the one we picked here. How does this work? Well, we had a loss function here that says this 30% should be as high as possible, as big probability as possible. So we have a loss function that says that there is some discrepancy and we try to minimize it. So we can do backpropagation or in practice PyTorch or TensorFlow will do backpropagation from us and get the gradients from here back to our parameter n, back through the GNN and the parameters that the GNN has and back to the way that we computed the initial node representations, so in this case the node embeddings. And we can keep repeating this again and again for each example. So far, I haven't discussed what is the exact architecture of the graph neural network we're going to use here. Indeed, this is not an important choice in terms of modeling, although it will affect the performance of the model. We can use a standard graph neural network, like a gated graph neural network, or a GCN, or we can use a transformer, uh, like, which is an extension of a graph neural network. So, there are many different possibilities. Recently, Vincent Hellendum and his colleagues showed that across a different set of architectures, then using the uh, either transformers or RNNs sandwiched, so one after another with a graph neural network, seems to give quite good performance. Or using transformers that are, have information about the exact edges is something that is very fast uh, and also gives very competitive performance. So overall, you see here the numbers, and here specifically, we can look at the numbers in this column. So you see, you see here, for example, in this column, that if we are about to classify whether some snippet of code has a variable misuse or not, we can do this with an 80% accuracy, more or less. If we are further to localize the exact place and find the exact repair that we're looking for, this accuracy gets to 76 or 73%, depending on the size of the snippet that we're looking for.
So this suggests that graph neural networks and transformers or and various combinations among them are quite useful for this problem. At the same time, you see that with a 70 something percent accuracy, this is not necessarily something that you can use right now. In this final part, I would like to discuss some practical tips about developing deep learning and other machine learning models. These are usually tips that you hear from other practitioners and researchers, but you don't usually find in books or papers. Hopefully they're useful for your course too. First of all, what are the moving pieces, the parts of common deep learning code? First of all, there is a data extraction part that you see here. The data extraction is a way of extracting the features from your data that you're interested in. So in case for machine learning of code, you, your data should probably be source code or some other artifact related source code, and the features you extract are domain dependent. The next thing you're interested in is the, the metadata. The metadata is information, summary information about the data that you, uh, that you have. And this data is very useful for building your machine learning model and converting your data into tensors. So what are these examples? So examples of metadata in graph neural networks, for example, are the types of edges that a graph, neural net, a graph can have. Also, in an NLP context or in a context of, uh, of source code again, is the vocabulary or the, the tokens or subtokens that uh, your neural network is going to represent. So, for example, you are, might decide that uh, you want to represent the word architecture and the word learning in your data, but the word common is very uncommon, uh, so in that case uh, you don't want to represent it. You also want to decide that maybe architecture is, uh, is uh, assigned to ID number 5 or uh, learning is assigned to ID number 17. So once you have this metadata, then you can convert your data into tensors, as you see here. The idea here is that neural networks do not understand strings or other structures, but instead represent, understand matrices and tensors. So, for example, in order to represent a sequence of tokens, a sequence of words, you need to represent them as a sequence of integer IDs. And this is the IDs you've computed during metadata computation. Once you have converted this, uh, this, uh, this data to tensors, it is ready for consumption from your neural network. At the same time, you need to use the metadata to build your neural network, your deep learning model. So, for example, the number of words that are subwords or subtokens that you are going to represent in your code defines the size of the embedding layer. So you need the metadata in order to build your deep learning model and initialize the weights that you're going to use. Finally, to move to training, you first need to use mini batches. So you need to take each sample individually, which is a set of tensors, and uh, batch a few of those into a single big mini batch and pass it directly to your neural network, which can then use uh, this uh, use this mini batch to compute a loss, backpropagate, and update the weight. So essentially, in the training loop. Of course, beyond that, they, we also have hyperparameters. These are some values that are useful for uh, either computing the metadata, building the machine learning model, creating mini badges, and so on. And these are hand-picked values that uh, you have to pick. Usually, what uh, people suggest is to follow the hyperparameters that other papers or other things in the literature have been using. You may also want to, uh, to tune your hyperparameters by picking essentially uh, hyperparameters that optimize some metric on your validation set. Finally, here is a set of somewhat practical tips on debugging machine learning models. It's notoriously hard to debug machine learning models because everything is numbers, tensors, everything is probabilistic. But there are some recipes that you can follow to make sure that most things are going well, or at least can help you find and pinpoint where a bug exists. 
So first of all, you want to test about your model capacity, whether your model can learn. The common uh, recipe here is to take a very small portion of the dataset and try to overfit, overtrain your model on that small dataset. So your training, validation, and test set should be exactly the same. It should be like 10 or 20 or 50 examples. And your model should be able to exactly predict the, from the input the target output. This makes sure that if it cannot overfit on those uh, on, on this uh, data set, it suggests that something bigger is uh, wrong at this point. The next step, once you have done that and you have successfully overfit a small data set, is to use some form of synthetic data. Data that you manually create and, has, uh, and the data has the phenomenon that you're trying to capture. Again, now this is a case where you have no noise, no, the data is not noisy, it's synthetic, you've just created it, and you, the model should be able to capture uh, the phenomenon that you're trying to capture. If it doesn't, then probably you still have a problem. There are, of course, many cases where we have optimization issues in the sense that the model itself is right, but then there is something uh, that is wrong. So the first thing is to look at the learning curve, which we'll discuss later. But other cases are that you want to, you may want to be looking to monitor the gradient rate update ratio. So you want to see whether the ra the ratio of uh, the norm of the gradient over the parameters is too small or too big. If it's too big, so it's, uh, let's say for example that the gradient each time it's two times the parameters, the gradient norm each time is two times the norm of the parameter. This means that the parameters are swinging widely and your model is not learning. If the gradient ratios are close to zero, it means that this great, these parameters are never being updated. So again, the model is not learning. So one, you, one common recipe is to uh, try to have a ratio which is somewhere to the 10 to the minus 3, 2 or 4. And finally, for very synthetic examples and very simple networks, you may be able to handpick parameters which actually, for some synthetic data, which actually capture, uh, capture the phenomenon that you're trying to do. This is harder, but if you cannot, if you pick those parameters and still something is going wrong, then you probably have a bug, and this process can help you find the bug. Of course, there are many, many other uh, types of bugs, and uh, there is no unique way of capturing them. The main thing is to generate the samples from your model. So if it's a language model that generates source code, for example, then, uh, for example, you can try and run this as generative model. Do the examples look reasonable? Is there some phenomenon that's happening that can indicate and can pinpoint a bug? The next big and very useful way to doing is visualization. And no one can underestimate the importance of visualization. So learning to visualize aspects of your network, such as the embeddings, nearest neighbors of some representation, can help you pinpoint bugs and understand what is going on. So there is this saying that uh, error analysis is debugging, uh, is to debugging, uh, error analysis in machine learning is what debugging is in traditional programming. And this is what you can do. In error analysis, you can look at the most confident mistakes that your model makes. These might indicate issues with your model. Of course, if everything else has failed, then the only way is to backtrack and simplify the problem, simplify the model and try to see whether you can capture that. If you can find the problem in a simpler setting, then maybe you can move on to a more complex one. And finally, of course, there are cases where you just need to increase the capacity of neural network, so increase the, the size of a hidden layer, for example, or do a wide sweep of hyperparameters. So here is a learning curve, and just it's worth discussing uh, this uh, learning curve separately. And you should always be trying to plot this curve. So during time here on the x-axis, and uh, you are plotting the loss on the y-axis. If all goes well, in a standard case, what you have is that your training curve keeps falling, uh, and eventually the loss would fall uh, down to zero. However, in many cases, uh, in many cases, this could mean you overfit. So you need to continuously validate on a small validation set, so a, a small test set, if you wish, and see how the loss behaves over there. 
And usually the loss has the form that you see here in this green curve. Essentially, what you're interested in is to have a point somewhere here where essentially your training loss is as low as possible, but also your test loss is, uh, is quite low. If you go any further, then your model will start overfitting. If you stop before that, your model will probably have underfitted. So with that, we've discussed about graphical networks and how they are applied in software engineering in uh, research. Hopefully this was an interesting and useful introduction, both about graphical networks and how to apply them in source code artifacts. Hopefully some of you will go on and use these graphical networks in your projects uh, in this course. Thank you for listening.